I was working on a problem of my own, which is I have the highest value of heavy rare earth deposit outside of China. And what I discovered pretty quickly was you couldn't actually bring those rare earths to market into the value chain in the United States because of the thorium content and quickly learned that this was a universal problem and the only solution was inside China. They're willing to process those materials, but the West has essentially written off any thorium-based rare earths. Policy on thorium has to change, and this is where I started my mission, and this is how I met John. The place we're at in, in, in thorium policy in all Western nations undermines the, the probability of, of a successful development of a domestic rare earth market. Uh, and in fact, uh, Mountain Pass was originally closed, uh, according to CEO Mark Smith, because of the EPA in the state of California and some thorium that, uh, that came out of a ruptured tailings uh, pipe. So, so the thorium represents this unknown, unlimited liability to, to rare earth production, and so consequently, all Western countries essentially wave it off. No one will touch it. This only plays into the hands of China, of course, and what they've been able to do is essentially consolidate control, not just the rare earth market, but they've moved all the way up the value chain to the point where they're producing um, five, six, nine, uh, uh, refined rare earths, uh, and uh, which nobody else can do, by the way, and are actually able to leverage their position into uh, 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 capturing other other countries' technologies, other countries' IP. If Toyota really wants to build a, a million battery packs, in the end, uh, if they don't find a solution to the heavy rare earth uh, uh, problem, they'll be building them inside China, and everybody else will be building their their IP technology in China. I'm not opposed to China. I just, I live in this country. I'm raising children with my wife in this country. And, uh, you know, I don't want to have to leave, but, but we have to have a future. China has not only essentially monopolized rare earths and that whole technology base, but the next move they're involved in is to essentially go after and control global IP for thorium energy. If you don't recognize this threat, it's going to eat you. All of the rare earths that most Western mining companies are willing to process are what they call bastnocytes or carbonatites. They typically select these rare earths not because of the high ratios of rare earths, but simply the absence of thorium. So consequently, the only operating rare earth mine that just opened up this year, according to their own uh, filings in the USGS, produces essentially the, the lighter half of the lanthanide scale and, in fact, does have some monazites, which are a thorium rare earth and rich mineralization, which they dispose of because they can't handle the thorium issue. The second most prevalent form of rare earths and, and the most common form of heavies in terms of total aggregate would be monazite or phosphate types. They typically are avoided or even commonly disposed of because of the thorium. So what happens all across America, Canada and South America, there are beautiful monazite deposits that have heavy rare earths that could be very commercial except for the thorium content. The United States obviously needs a new strategy, and that strategy has to address the thorium issue. I've been uh, talking to the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and, and legislators for a number of years now, and I'm trying to do some, some, something that, that worked for America in our historical past, a rare earth cooperative, an old-fashioned farmer co-op type concept where you would essentially authorize a single facility initially, and then a, that could become dozens of facilities eventually, but start off with a single centralized facility that can ex accept thorium-bearing monazites or phosphate-type rare earths, extract out the rare earths, pass them up the value chain, uh, nobody's trying to eat anybody's lunch here. This could be a cooperative which would offer tolling or purchasing services to, to rare earth mining companies or to companies that produce byproducts. But ultimately what it does is it radically reduces the level of financial risk for the primary producers of rare earths. And then it takes that thorium and it has to have the legitimate and economic reasonable way to deal with the thorium. You could have a typical monazite deposit that has 8% rare earths, and it could actually have 8% thorium. So as you're making sales here, you're stacking and building a, an unknown liability over here called thorium. And as we all know, the way the government plays the game, one day this thing's going to kill you. So what we need to be able to do is, is say to the government, give these guys the authority to extract the thorium, and then let another entity take that thorium 
and, in, and convert it into, give them the authority to develop uses and in markets, including energy. With just that simple sentence right there, you are implying authority and you're, you're, you're essentially uh, a creating a, a, a little bit of wiggle room or a regulatory pathway, just Congress conceding that this is an issue and it needs to be dealt with responsibly, get in front of it, not behind it, and create an entity that has the authority to develop uses and markets and energy. You now have a single vehicle where you can bring in interested parties to develop the technology that have a known or a visualized pathway to commercialization. So let's say, for example, you had a single rare earth refinery creating about 20,000 tons of heavy rare earths a year. On current consumption, that's about 130% of domestic consumption for rare earths. It automatically undermines China's advantage. Now there's two places on the planet Earth where you have a guaranteed supply of heavy rare earths. What can your country leverage that into? Seriously, think about it. You would be the only other supplier of rare earths and a guaranteed supply of heavy rare earths outside China who is essentially capturing IP and other and, and manufacturing. This is the fulcrum you need to get back into the, the world economy as a manufacturer, value-added producer. On another note, you would produce enough thorium, which would historically have been dumped into tailings lakes, to provide power through thorium molten salt reactors to power the entire Western Hemisphere and I've been told in every single presentation that's an understatement, I know it is. If we can convince our government to step up to the responsibility of dealing with the rare earth issue, which means dealing with the thorium issue, and when you deal with the thorium issue, you need to, to create an entity that has the authority to develop uses and in markets, including energy. And if you do that, we have just put ourselves on the path for a new era in U.S. economic growth and a path towards total energy independence. Thorium is the companion element to almost every rare earth deposit. There are exceptions, but generally speaking, in heavier rare earth deposits, thorium becomes even more common. What are the exceptions? Ionic clays that have 0.2% rare earth, which means you're mining 98.8% waste to get two tenths of a percent. I don't see any country in the West trying to produce rare earths on a deposit like that. So bringing up discussions of exceptions, I think, is not very productive. I apologize to anyone who's not a U.S. citizen, but John and I are, and we really, in our hearts, believe that America developed this, uh, and, and America should lead the way. Molten salt will be the global leading form of baseload energy in the entire world for a number of reasons. First of all, it's basically a proven technology. There are no significant hurdles. Thorium is a safe, fertile monoisotope that has, I'm going to say this despite what you heard earlier today, Thorium itself has no proliferation risk whatsoever. Thorium can't be made into a dirty bomb. Thorium can't be a bomb. Thorium is on the beaches. A 12-year-old kid can make pure thorium at home with a little chemistry from, from the hardware store. Thorium is everywhere. Thorium's not risky. When you build these things on assembly lines, the capex cost will come down to the point where you're going to be able to build them for the power of coal steam. It offers the safest form of base load for all the reasons you've heard before. Because the fuel essentially will be a byproduct of, of another mining or, or even mining byproduct uh, source, the cost of the fuel will be de minimis. So uh, what is the cost of energy? The cost of energy is simply the capital cost amortized and the proper monitoring of safe operations. Once again, all fractional to what it costs to, to operate a large-scale nuclear reactor. It's also carbon-free, so we're talking about a clean, carbon-free energy solution that the United States can offer to the world. Here's where I'm gonna apologize again. This is pretty uh, U.S. Centro based. Look, peak oil, if it's not real, you're at least paying for it at the pumps right now. And the reality is U.S. control of that resource is shrinking dramatically. Coal itself is not a good substitute for energy. Uh, as it stands, and even if you clean coal up, there are still a lot of problems. You can't really replace the backbone of energy with coal. You need something else. Others have discussed whether uh, wind blows all the time or whether the sun shines 24 hours a day on one side of the planet. It doesn't. You need baseload. Baseload is the key to everything. So we believe because of the, the capital cost for building a safe MSR is going to be fractional to any other nuclear alternative and very consistent with, with baseload coal, and its delivered cost relative to fuel will be fractional. 
it will eventually be able to replace all other forms of electric energy. I mean, sure, you'll still have gas peakers and things, but generally speaking, it's going to become the leading baseload. Now, when I say uh, all fuels, liquid fuels, Robert once again pointed out there's a number of ways to use the low cost of energy and MSR to, to produce liquid fuels. We're not getting away from liquid fuels very anytime soon. There is not a single active program other than Kirk, who recently jumped in, threw his hat in the ring. But I mean, in, in terms of a funded program, there's not a single program in the United States right now. China has committed uh, the equivalent of a, a billion dollars U.S., which, by the way, is roughly the calculations that John and I and others have come up with for the cost of actually developing your first units. So going all the way through IP to fully constructed operational units. There are a number of private international groups that are also seeking control of IP. This is the most important thing that's going to happen in the next 24 months. And whoever gets that is essentially going to control the destiny and the rollout of energy for the foreseeable future. We believe that the United States should be leading that. I can assure you the plan includes every single partner that we can bring into this worldwide, our friends in Canada, our friends in Brazil, our friends in Europe, uh, but essentially building one platform for the MSR. If the MSR is developed outside the United States, the NRC is facing absolutely very real problems in terms of credibility. You can't have the world move on without you with what, for all practical and measurable purposes, is a safer form of energy. Why are we sustaining an energy system that was the byproduct of the Cold War? It's time to move on, especially when the rest of the world is ready to move on without us. This is a strictly U.S. problem. I think everybody in the room is mature enough to deal with these facts. Without a radical change in fiscal and monetary policy in the United States, we will sink into the ocean. We have, we have a debt situation which is completely out of control. We have a tax base that is dwindling. Uh, and the only way to do this is for the United States to get on board and get behind what could be the single most important global commercial enterprise and make sure that they are able to participate that in the tax base. I know that there's a lot of people who don't like to pay taxes. I don't, but you can't really run governments without them. But this is a real problem. We see the development of molten salt reactors managed through the U.S. with shared revenue partnerships with every participating nation that's involved and invests, essentially trying to bring some salvation to this particularly thorny subject. I differ a little bit from Bob. I actually believe that you probably need one global platform controlling IP and controlling distribution. And the reason for that is if you've got two or three or four people in the molten salt energy business, we're all now competing with each other trying to build the cheapest system, right? Who wants the cheapest nuclear system because we're competing on price now because we have nothing else to compete on. And you're going to be getting calls from your AT&T and MCI and singular sellers of energy who are all competing at cost to sell you energy packages and where are they cutting costs to be able to roll out uh, um, uh, this industry which is going to be a very capex intensive industry. We don't believe it's safe or rational or fiscally or monetarily responsible for multiple players to be competing in the field. We believe one player who sets up a system that's fair for every single participant internationally that participates is the only way to go, it's the only way to assure safety, and it's the only way to assure that the energy business doesn't end up like America's once great and now quite a horrifying airline industry of empty seats and bank multiple bankruptcy. It just doesn't work. You can't compete on that basis. It's not commercially viable. The way we look at it is, who's your partner? Your partner is the government. Who in the government? Well, the Department of Defense, uh, who originally in Oak Ridge and all of these uh, uh, entities that are going to be helping you develop the, the IP and you don't do what is typical among industry, which is basically skirt all your IP obligations to the government. You just say, we accept them right up front. You're our partner. And then you can actually bring the government into the economic model. Another reason why you can't have multiple players in the field Politics is politics is politics. And unless you can protect the existing stakeholders, nobody's ever going to let you birth this baby because there's way too much money being made. There's way too much money invested into the status quo. 
And if you can actually roll everything out under a controlled environment, you can actually protect all of the stakeholders. Oil will continue to be a good part of the economy, and why shouldn't it be? If you're rapidly eliminating much dirtier forms of, of carbon emissions, then it's a pretty fair trade-off. What do you do about coal? Coal is potentially your biggest obstacle. What do you do? You invite coal in and you create certain incentives so that coal can also participate in it. Those incentives should be for subsidies for the conversion of coal and other things into liquid hydrocarbons. I think if everybody kind of left with this concept, we could not put numbers, we couldn't get sign-offs from people that matter to us. But essentially when there's more or less meltdown risk, technically speaking there's zero meltdown risk in a thorium molten salt reactor. Obviously with the uranium-based uh, uh, solid fuel reactor in the world and the very few number of meltdowns, they are safe. But they're not safe enough, I don't think. And this is true for all of these other key issues. We can give you background for why we think these are fair statements. First of all, you don't have loss of coolant. Let's say you have an emergency. This is probably one of the most incredible things you can do. You can literally just shut the darn thing down by essentially dumping your fuel coolant away into a safe storage area. This could be done remotely. This could be done, as, as Kirk pointed out, with seismic. This could be done based on temperature. It can be denatured. It can simply be stored and not denatured and then reheated and pumped back in. Uh, one of the tricky issues is this one. You need a little bit of starter fluid to get it going. There is the only proliferation risk in the entire system, and this makes up a small part of the entire fuel. From a Jack Bauer type technical, we're going to track this and make it safe. That's the best thing you could be using because, man, you can find it wherever it is. There are some potential proliferation advantages even though you are using the U-233. We'd certainly like some feedback on these because we think that when we get these more developed, these could possibly be some of the most important selling points for this conceptually. If you want to win this game, you have to bring risks into terms that people can understand, normal people. Grab the 10 most frightening things about what we know about nuclear reactors today and show what the alternative is in risk terms that people can understand, the public acceptance becomes very, very high and you're going to need a lot of public support to push this thing through. I got the impression that there's pretty much a lot of thorium just laying around ready to be used. Yes. In which case, why do we need to mine it and uh, you know, we're still going to have an excess? Okay, that's the first question. The second question, uh, from my understanding of the rare earths, particularly heavy, is it for the uh, permanent load generators that can use in wind turbines? That's the really big point use. It uses the heavies. That's the big wild part for future use. But if you've got this, the thorium, uh, the thorium reactors, we don't need the windows, right? I love the second question. Uh, I won't even touch that. Uh, what I'm saying is, in fact, when you don't have to mine thorium, you would never have to mine thorium. Thor you could get global supply of thorium to turn every light bulb on in the world just as a byproduct of intelligently uh, mining the rare earths that you need. And it w it's a f essentially a free byproduct. It drops out for no cost. When you extract, when you want to separate your mineralization, when you want to pull the, the, the oxides, the rare earth oxides out of the mineralization, the host mineralization, you're going to basically dissolve it through a number of, of factors and the thorium is so dense, it is not going to go into solution. So almost every known way to extract rare earths from their mineral concentrates means that thorium just literally drops out like a rock and you have it. So while you're meeting the world's uh, rare earth demands, the thorium is free. So it's going to be the most valuable commodity in the world with almost no value. If we do this right. Yeah. Second one I don't want to touch. Is there a political update on the Hill? Anything you two can share with us about recent developments? Uh, it's this summer or never. How about that? Yeah, that's a pretty good way uh, to put it. That's what I can tell you. It's this summer or never. Took the words right out of my mouth. Thanks a lot.